Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History. The Battle of Antioch on the Meander was one of the most important battles in the 13th century for the Eastern Roman Empire, and led to the continual survival of the Empire of Nicaea. The Turks threatened to conquer Asia Minor and bring an end to the state that would eventually restore the Eastern Roman Empire for two and a half centuries. After the arrival of Crusader forces to restore Alexius IV, Theodore Lascaris and his family fled the city and, after convincing the inhabitants, set about diplomatically gaining control of the region surrounding Nicaea by September 1203. By 1211, Theodore I Lascaris, who in ten years had gone from nothing to controlling a realm stretching from Paphlagonia in the northeast to the Meander Valley in the south, had cobbled together a state from the ruins of Byzantine Asia Minor. Other regions, such as Aldobrandini's domain in Atalia, had been conquered by the Turks in 1207, showing that some were not so fortunate. Equally, Theodore's domain was united, but still fragile. It was sandwiched between the Latins in Constantinople and the Turks of Rum. To strengthen his army, he offered higher wages to any Latin knight that would serve him rather than the Latin emperor. Through this method, he coaxed 800 Latin knights to Nicene service. This caused Pope Innocent III to write a letter on the 7th of December 1210, telling the Latin Patriarch of Constantinople to excommunicate Latin defectors to the Nicaeans. However, the greatest challenge to the Theodore's burgeoning empire was about to arrive. In 1211, Caicus Raw I was approached by the emperor in exile, Alexios III Angelos. In 1199-1200, Alexios III had sheltered Caicus Raw when he had been deposed. The two became friends during the latter's exile. In 1203, once Alexios III had abandoned Constantinople, he moved to Thrace, and then after the fall of Constantinople, moved to Missinopolis, where he received his daughter, Eudokia, and the other emperor in exile, Alexios V. Caicus Raw followed Alexios III into exile. Alexios III loathed Alexios V for many reasons, especially for having married his daughter, Eudokia. Cognates notes that Alexios V married Eudokia after he abandoned Constantinople rather than before, hosting Alexios V Ducas Mutsufalos as his guest. He and his wife took a bath. As they bathed, Alexios III's servants burst in and blinded Alexios Mutsufalos. Macrides also notes that to Alexios III, Alexios V was a usurper and was punished as such. Alexios V was left to wander the wilderness, making his way to Asia Minor before being apprehended by Terry de Luz, who brought him back to Constantinople. The Latins punished Alexios V for the crime of murdering Alexios IV, the nephew of Alexios III. Robert de Clary reported what happened in his chronicle of the capture of Constantinople. And when they had come, the Emperor Baldwin then told them how he had Mutsuflos in prison, and he asked them what they advised him to do with him. Then some said that he should be hanged, others that he should be drawn and quartered. But at last the Doge of Venice said that he was a man of too high birth to be hanged. But to such a man of high birth, said the Doge, I will tell you what manner of justice shall be done. There are in this city two high pillars, nor is either less than sixty or fifty fathoms high, so let him be made to mount the top of one of these, and then let him be hurled headlong to the ground. And to what the doge said the barons agreed. So Metsuphilus was taken and led to one of these pillars, and made to mount the steps which were on the inside thereof. And when Metsuphilus stood at the top, they then pushed him, so that he fell to the ground and was dashed in all pieces. 
Such was the vengeance that they took on Zuflus the traitor. Acropolites tells us that it was the column of Theodosius I that Alexios was thrown off in the Forum of the Taurus. In 1205, Caicosraw returned to Rum after the death of his brother and became sultan again. Alexios III moved from Missinopolis to Thessalonica, and while there, Eudokia was married to Leo Suguros, the ruler of Corinth. Alexios also gave him the title of despot, marking him out as his new heir instead of Theodore Lascaris, who previously received this honour. Macrides also argues that this signified Alexios's reassertion of his right to the throne. In 1208, other sources also suggest Alexios III granted John Kamateros, the ruler of Laconia, the title of despot after the death of Seguros. He also recognised Michael Comnemnus Ducus as ruler of Epirus. However, Alexios III was captured by Boniface during the Latin advance into Greece. Boniface stripped him of his imperial regalia and sent him to Halmyros in Thessaly. From there, he was sent to Montferrat in Italy. In 1210, Michael Comnemnus Ducus of Epirus ransomed his uncle, who returned from exile, and was released to the custody of his relative. Alexios III had achieved much during his exile. Macrides sees his actions as those of a ruler determined to return to the throne. He had eliminated the upstart Alexios Ducus Metsuphilus. He married and designated a new heir in Suguros and then Kamateros, both men leading Byzantine resistance in Greece against the Latins, and implicitly uniting that part of the realm under Alexios's authority. He legitimized the rule of Michael Comnemnus Ducus, who might similarly come into the fold. He had friends amongst the Turks. All he needed to do now was to pose his relative, Theodore Lascaris, and drive out the Latins to restore both his throne and his empire. Macrides conjectured that the feckless wastrel presented to us by Nikitas Coniatis may have experienced a change in attitude by the experiences after his fall from power. Now Alexios decided to leave the domain of Michael and asked his friend, Caicus Raw I, for help. He sailed to Italia to meet the Sultan. Caicus Raw sent Theodore a letter stating that Alexios had arrived and accused Theodore of usurping Alexios III's position, which would support Macrides' idea that Alexios III had ceased considering Lascaris as his heir after 1203. Caicus Raw planned to use Alexios III as his casus belli to invade and conquer the whole of the Nicene Empire. The severity of the situation for Lascaris is summed up by Acropolites. As the saying goes, matters stood on the razor's edge of the Emperor Theodore. Theodore Lascaris immediately assembled his army and required them to state whether they stood with him or with his father-in-law. They unanimously proclaimed their loyalty to Theodore. Theodore also sent letters to his people, imploring them for aid. He kept the Sultan's ambassador with him and travelled with his army to Philadelphia in 11 days. Meanwhile, the Sultan assembled his army and marched with Alexios III to the Meander Valley and besieged Antioch. The city controlled access to the rich Meander Valley and was strategically imperative to take. Acropolites makes clear that if Caicus Raw captured Antioch on the Meander, he would be able to conquer the Meander Valley and the rest of the Nicene Empire. Furthermore, he says, Theodore also understood this and decided to risk everything in a battle. The only acceptable result was victory. To increase the speed of the Nicene army, Theodore instructed his soldiers to leave behind everything except for some food, their clothes and arms. Theodore's army consisted of 12,000 Niceans and 800 Latins. His army seems to have adopted the ensign of the cross before the battle, possibly due to nearly half of his army being comprised of Latins. It would also make sense, as the foe they faced were heathens. 
the number of Kaikos Ra's army is unknown. Ibn Bibi gave totals of 5,000 soldiers and 14,000 cavalry. The only half believable total was by the traveller Simon de Saint Quentin, who wrote that the Turks had 11,000 men. If so, Theodore was outnumbered five and a half to one. While this too is likely an exaggeration, it is the most acceptable out of all the estimates since cavalry, professional infantry, and levies could reasonably be factored into the total. It was not until Theodore reached Antioch that he allowed the Turkish ambassador to return to the Sultan. The ambassador informed the Sultan of the Emperor's approach. Caicus Roar was in total disbelief. The Sultan readied for battle. The valley surrounding Antioch on the Meander was narrow, and thus Caicus Roar could not deploy his cavalry nor the full array of his army. Theodore's army arrived on the 15th of June, 1211. Upon arrival to the field of battle, Theodore's Latin knights immediately charged the significantly larger Turkish army in a suicidal attack. Hacking away at limbs and smoting heads from shoulders, the 800 Latin knights smashed through the Turkish lines and made short work of their light infantry. Having cut through the first formation, they wheeled around and charged again. However, to their hundreds, Caicos Raw had thousands, and the knights were eventually overwhelmed and annihilated. Acropolites later wrote in his history, It was then that the army of Franks, which was attached to Theodore, had been destroyed. He had relied on them even for warfare against their own people, and the Emperor Henry also feared them. For many of them were renowned because of their race, but also for their innate courage. That is why, as some say, when Henry heard about the Emperor's victory, he remarked, Lascaris was vanquished, not victorious. The Turks then turned to attack the remaining Nicene forces and quickly overwhelmed the small army. All seemed lost, with many Nicene soldiers routing from the field. Those that remained were fighting to the last. Then, Caicus Raw sought out Theodore to kill him. Acropolites reported, They recognized each other. The Sultan struck the Emperor on the head with a mace, and he fell from his horse, for he was dizzied by the stroke. The horse also lost its footing, they say, because of the stroke. I do not know if it also received a second blow from the Sultan. So the Emperor freeing himself from his horse, and, as if strengthened by a divine force, stood on his feet and drew his sword from its sheath. And, as the Sultan was turning from him and saying with insolence, Take him away! The Emperor struck the hind legs of the Sultan's horse. The Sultan was mounted on a mare of enormous size, and so the Sultan was thrown down, as if from a tower, and suddenly his head was cut off. Although neither the Emperor, nor any one of those who was with the Emperor, knew by whom he had been decapitated. So in this way the Emperor was victorious. Although he was largely defeated, for left with meagre forces, he could not advance at all. The sudden death of the Sultan caused the Turkish army to lose heart, and they fled in disorder. Ibn Bibi and Konyatis, the latter being more contemporaneous than Acropolites, mentioned that Theodore was knocked out of his saddle by Caicus Roar, which confirms that part of his account. After Theodore had been unhorsed, Ibn Bibi adds that Caicus Roar said, Oh, you scabby head, allowing Theodore to get up and ride away. Konyatis and Ibn Bibi corroborate the size of Caicus Roar's massive horse. Konyatis also mentions Theodore hacked at the horse's legs to unhorse the Sultan. For whom actually killed Caicus Roar? Nikitas Konyatis' panegyric to the Emperor Theodore, which he wrote for the occasion of his victory, is closest to the events. He says Theodore himself killed the Sultan. However, it is clear that this claim was made by many people, since Acropolites, who lived a generation after Theodore, did not speculate as to who carried out the act. His counterpart, Ibn Bibi, 
says a Latin in Theodore's army cut off the sultan's head, certainly a possibility since not all of Theodore's army had left the field. One way or the other, the death of the sultan saved the Nicaeans from the jaws of defeat. Alexios III was captured by Theodore in the battle's aftermath. He was brought to Nicaea and was forced to hand over his imperial insignia, being exiled to the monastery of Hyakinthos, where he died. Scutariotes interjects and says the senate and army sentenced Alexios to blinding. Either way, he was eliminated as a threat to Theodore Lascaris. The son of Caicus Raw, Isaldin Caicus, made peace with the emperor soon after the battle in 1211. Though low-level conflict continued along the frontier between the Nicaeans and Turks, the peace removed them as a threat for the rest of Theodore I's reign. Thus the Battle of Antioch on the Meander, though a near catastrophe for Theodore I, ended up in a victory which saved the Nicaean Empire. If you enjoyed this video, please do like and subscribe. Thank you very much to my generous patrons, and this has been Eastern Roman History. Music